So in this last lecture, I will present some recent results concerning integral points on algebraic surfaces. These recent results are uh, joint work uh, with uh, Umberto Zanner. And our method of proof is based on the subspace theorem, so it follows the pattern of our um, alternate proof of Siegel theorem. Um, before our work, I think that um, all the known results could be deduced from uh, uh, the theorem of uh, Faltings and Voita, which I've already cited. I give its statement again, which is actually much, uh, which is much general. It, it holds on arbitrary dimension, and it says that if X is a subvariety of uh, G, where G is a semi-abelian variety, And uh, x not to translate of a sub group, then x of OS is not the risky dense. So this is. Faltings void the method. Well, I'll show that using um, the subspace theorem, we can recover some cases which do not fall into uh, uh, the theorem of Faltings and void. So, first of all, um, which kind of results can we hope to prove for surfaces? I uh, recall that in the case of curves, um, I proved that, that if we remove three points from any projective curve, the corresponding affine curve has only finitely many integral points, independently on the curve. And this was uh, essentially Siegel theorem in the sense that the full Siegel theorem could be obtained from this particular case uh, via the Schwalevay theorem. So um, what is the analog of the number three for surfaces? One can uh, try to prove a result of the kind given any compact uh, surface. If we remove at least n curves uh, from this surface, then the corresponding open surface will have only finitely many integral points or a degenerate set of integral points. Well, such a theorem uh, cannot hold. Uh, consider, for, for instance, the case of the affine plane, A2. It's clearly that integral points are the risky dense, and one can ask how many curves at infinity has this surface. If you look at A2 as a, an open subset of the P2 of the projective plane, then A2 is obtained by removing just one curve, a line. But if you view A2 as a subset of P1 cross P1, which is P1 
clearly possible since the affine line is contained in the projective line. So the square of the affine line is contained in the square of the projective line. It will have two components at infinity. A1 is the complement of one point, infinity. And so A2 will be a complement of the horizontal line, uh, P1 cross infinity, and the vertical line, infinity cross P1. But you can even compactify A2 in uh, many other ways. You can achieve, if you want, 100 curves at infinity. Simply take uh, one compactification, for instance, the, the, the first one I gave, with just one curve at infinity, and you blow up as many points as you want on the uh, curve at infinity. If you blow up 99 points, you'll have uh, a new compactification which is formed of um, by which is obtained by adding 100 curves at infinity. So even removing 100 curves will not produce, in general, uh, a degenerate set of integral points. So uh, the question will not be on the number of um, curves at infinity. Uh, for those who are acquainted with the language of algebraic geometry, you know that um, divisors can be grouped by uh, algebraic equivalence. You can say that when two divisors are algebraically equivalent, and uh, well, by definition, points on a curve are all. Uh, algebraic equivalent. Two points on a curve are uh, algebraically equivalent divisors. If you take uh, two curves on a surface, in general they will not be um, equivalent, algebraically equivalent, and not even uh, will be uh, algebraically equivalent up to constant. So it, it will not be true that one multiple of the curve is uh, equivalent to the multiple of the other. And so, uh, um, and this is the problem. So in this case, you have uh, two curves at infinity which are not uh, algebraically equivalent. So um, the problem is uh, taking care of the uh, of this um, not only of the abstract set of um, curves at infinity, but of their uh, relations, modulo algebraic equivalence. And uh, the results that we obtained can be expressed in terms of the intersection matrix of, at infinity. So I recall uh, some facts about uh, intersection products. curves on a, a complete a smooth surface. So if, if you take two curves, C1, C2, curves and X tilde is a complete surface can define the intersection product as the number of uh, points with multiplicity in C1 intersect with C2 if this intersection is finite, uh, which is certainly the case when C1, C2 are two distinct uh, irreducible curves. In general, if the two curves have components in common, uh, the problem arises of defining uh, the square of of an irreducible curve. So the intersection product of a curve with itself. And then the idea is finding a 
curve prime, which is algebraically equivalent to C, not uh, equal to C. And then uh, C squared is, by definition, the intersection product of C, C prime. Topologically, it means that uh, you can deform the curve C, which uh, can be viewed as uh, a surface on the four-dimensional variety X tilde. And after deformation, you obtain another algebraic curve, so another surface, which intersects the, the given one only at finite many points. Actually, this intersection product uh, coincides with the intersection product on homology. So if you see uh, X tilde as a four-dimensional uh, real variety, so C can be viewed as a, uh, an oriented surface So it is a Riemann surface, so a surface in the, in the real sense. It is oriented by the fact that it and also X tilde is oriented. And then uh, C defines a class in H2. So uh, in this way, uh, you can use the topological notion of intersection. Now, uh, I will state our main theorem. So let X tilde be smooth, projective surface defined over a number of field K. Suppose that X is the open set obtained by removing from X tilde the union of R irreducible curves then uh, suppose there exists a positive integers P1 PR such that putting D equals P1 D1 plus PR DR the following conditions so First condition, D is big and numerically effective, which means that the intersection product with any curve is non-negative. And second, let each I CI be the minimal positive root of 
uh, the equation d minus c i d i square equals zero. By this we mean that we develop formally this uh, intersection product, which is d i square c i square minus twice the intersection product c i plus d square. Yep. We equal to zero and we find solution by a theorem in intersection theory called index theorem. It can be proved that the solutions are real and at least one of them is positive under this condition. And you let CI be the minimal positive solutions. And the conditions too is that uh, d square c twice d square c i is larger than d d i c i square plus d i d square. Then for every ring of s integers. S, the integral points on x is not the risky dense. So these conditions are rather cumbersome to state. Actually, it's not easy to see when they are um, <coughs> satisfied. Anyway, it's clear that they only depend on the, uh, the matrix of the intersection product of the, the components at infinity. Well, there is just one, uh, excuse me. Pardon? Yeah? D is big. And uh, the product D times C is non-negative non for every curve C. The PI are positive, but uh, if C is D1, for instance, and D1 square is negative, which, which might happen, then... Okay. So... Uh, now... Uh, there is a condition which I forgot that uh, irreducible curve and uh, no three of them intersecting, which is a a weaker condition with respect to normal course. So I. We can admit intersections of this kind, which is not a normal crossing intersection, uh, provided there are just two curves which meet at one point. I don't understand. The, the number of divisors is called R. In, in principle, yes, but we can prove that for are uh, up to three, these conditions are never satisfied. So it must be uh, at least four. Um, actually, now I'll give uh, some, um, some corollaries. So when the di are algebraically equivalent or algebraically equivalent modulo constant, for instance, on P2, all divisors are um, actually are uh, pairwise linearly equivalent modular constants, so in particular algebraically equivalent. Uh, then conditions amount to one uh, and 
two are equivalent to r at least four. So we obtain again, in the case of the projective plane, what was already known, that uh, integral points on the complement of four curves are um, degenerate. And this fact also shows that in some sense our theorem is best possible because uh, in the case of projective plane, to take r equal 3, we would obtain false statement. Uh, removing three lines on the plane, uh, integral points remain the risk then. Actually, there is um, a, a nice theorem by uh, Levin. which is obtained as a corollary for our main theorem. Uh, which gives the generacy <coughs> of integral points when uh, r equal 4 and the di are ample devices. So what Levin did was to prove that in that case, one can always find weights p1, p4, such that these conditions are satisfied. And here again, one can see that it is best possible, because again, thinking at the projective plane, if you remove three lines, three lines are three ample divisors, and there's no surface. Also, it is clear once again that the ampleness hypothesis cannot be simply eliminated. For instance, uh, if you remove uh, four Uh, curves on P1, two horizontal lines and two vertical lines, you obtain again GM cross GM. So uh, integral points will be the risk dense, but, uh, but well, you have removed four devices. So there must be some condition on the, the device. And um, actually, this is a nice um, uh, generalization of Siegel theorem for curves. Actually, each point on a curve uh, represents an ample divisor. So Siegel theorem states that if you remove three ample divisors on a curve, you obtain the degeneracy of integral points. And uh, by this theorem, you obtain that uh, the right number of divisors to remove from any surface, of ample divisors to remove from any surface in order to guarantee the degeneracy of integral points on the complement is four and it, it is the right number. But actually, um, some of the most interesting cases, and I will give uh, at the end some concrete examples, arise when the divisors Ti are not ample. Uh, now some um, idea of the proof, just the idea, and I'd like just to show where do this intersection product come from, which point of the proof. So I go back to the proof of a, a Siegel theorem for curves. Remember that in the proof for curves, we consider uh, a curve, a complete curve, C tilde, and R points at infinity, Q1, QR, and we consider the divisor obtained just by summing up these curves with no weight. And then we consider the vector space L and D made of rational functions on the curve having poles only at the points Q1, QR, 
with poles of order at most n. And then we had to consider a filtration. So for each for each i, we had to to, to uh, find the basis of L and D made of functions having uh, zeros of highest possible multiplicity at QI. So we cannot have all functions having zeros at QI because uh, uh, in these vector spaces there are even functions having poles. But what we could do is to take just one function with maximum pole and then the second function on the basis will chosen to have um, a pole of lower level at most n minus 1 and so on. So the nth function um, would be regular, the n plus 1 function would have a 0 and so on. Uh, subsequent functions will have zeros of growing order. And the main point was that uh, if you fix a vector, spaces, a vector space of functions on a curve, you take one point and uh, for instance take one point where uh, this function can have poles of order at most, let's say, k. The subspace formed of functions we have uh, poles of order at most k minus 1 is either the whole space or a hyperplane. So the condition of uh, asking that the pole has lower order is, uh, is condition having price 1. It amounts to posing one linear condition. And um, if you take a point where uh, uh, the functions are regular, then it might be that all these functions vanish, or those that those vanish at this point form a hyperplane. Anyway, uh, the codimension of the subspace of vanishing function on this vector space uh, we consider is at most one. So each time uh, imposing one condition uh, costs uh, one dimension. On a higher dimension it's not like this. Consider for instance consider this case. So uh, in P2 D is the line at infinity. So space L of N D can be identified with polynomials in uh, uh, two variables x, y of total degree most n. Then take a divisor. We can take again the divisor d or uh, for simplicity we take uh, at infinity. So we take a curve in the affine plane in the complement of d. So for instance consider the line L defined by the equation x equals 0, so the y-axis. And we consider the subspace of function of L and D such that the restriction to L vanishes identically. And we try to, to estimate the codimension of this space in the dual space L of N D. So how many polynomials of total degree n, total degree up to n, vanish on the y-axis? 
So for a polynomial p of x, y, so if it, such a polynomial vanishes at L if and only if p of 0, y vanishes identically. Now we can write a polynomial in two variables of total degree at most n as a polynomial a0 y plus x a1 y plus x n minus 1 a n minus 1 y plus x n a n y where here the degree the polynomial a i is at most n minus i so the condition p zero y vanishes identically amounts to a zero being identically zero and a zero can have um, up to n plus one coefficients since it uh, its degree is bound by n so we obtain n plus one linear condition So the co-dimension co is not 1, it's n plus 1. Now consider a conic instead of a line. So let's see with the circle of equation x squared plus y squared minus 1 equals 0. And let's consider the sp subspace of functions in the linear system L and D vanishing identically on the circle C and let us estimate its co-dimension. So we can take um, an arbitrary polynomial P of x, y and to understand its behavior on the conic C it is worthwhile to divide it by x squared plus y squared minus 1 and uh, consider the remainder. So we view this polynomial as a monic polynomial in Y with coefficients in the ring of polynomials in X. Since it is monic in Y, we can perform uh, Euclidean uh, division. So we can write P of X, Y as X squared plus Y squared minus 1 plus a remainder and uh, multiplied by portion plus a remainder and this remainder will be polynomial of degree at most 1 in y. So it will be a of x plus y with x. And the degree of a will be most n and the degree of b will be most n minus 1. Now the vanishing of p on the conic amounts to vanishing of the remainder. So, P vanishes identically in 0, if and only if A is identically 0 and B is identically 0. So, we have n plus 1 plus n conditions. So, 2 n plus 1 linear conditions. So, uh, imposing vanishing on curves and surface is something that course uh, according to in some sense the degree of these curves and more precisely we obtain that the number in question uh, it was n plus 1 in the case of a line and this is the intersection product the divisor at infinity times the line plus 1, while 2n plus 1 
is the intersection product N D times conic plus one. And actually, it is a theorem that uh, in any case you can bound the condimension by the, this intersection product. The, this will be an upper bound in general. So, uh, in order to make the method work, uh, we have to take into account uh, the price to pay at each step in order to construct sections uh, vanishing at high order on, on the curves uh, at infinity and for this reason uh, the, the, these intersection products appear. Now, a corollary of our method applies to, um, to some simply connected surface. So, we can provide an example of a simply connected surface. For which uh, the generacy of integral points holds. Such example will never be obtained by the use of Faltings Voigta theorem which is based on uh, embedding varieties into semi-abelian varieties. Uh, every sub-variety of a, an abelian variety or a semi-abelian variety has uh, one forms, regular one forms, which are obtained by restricting the one forms of the, um, on the abelian varieties. And this one form gives non-trivial cl classes on the, the RAM uh, first cohomology space, uh, which would be trivial in the case of, the, of a simply connected variety. So uh, it never applies at least directly to um, simply connected surfaces, simply connected varieties. I show now that it cannot be applied even in uh, indirect way. Uh, I'll give an example. Suppose that uh, X is a surface, a fine or projective or quasi projective, doesn't matter. C is a curve of genus at least two, so that fault theorem holds for C, and you have a dominant rational map. So you can prove the generacy of rational points on X using faulting theorem, even if X does not embed into an abelian variety. Simply, Rational points on C are uh, finite in number by Fulton theorem. So rational points on X lie into a finite number of fibers of this map. So on finite, finitely many curves on X, so they cannot be the risky dense. Uh, so Fulton theorem actually is stronger than it appears. But nevertheless, even in this case, it cannot be applied if X is simply connected. Because uh, on C, you'll have uh, several um, regular one forms. Actually, the, the space of regular one forms has the dimension of the genus of C. And the pullback of these regular one forms uh, will be regular forms on X, even if the map is uh, just rational and not dominant. 
So you obtain that uh, the, the RAM cohomology group of X will be non-trivial. So in fact, it's simply connected. Such a situation does not uh, arise. Another indirect way to um, apply uh, Faulting's Voiter theorem is what I've already shown last time. Uh, if you take, an, for instance, an elliptic curve minus one point, it is a genus one projective curve. So this variety does not embed into um, a semi abelian variety as uh, a closed sub variety. And nevertheless, it admits a, a cover. You can take, for instance, a degree two cover. And this new uh, variety, well, uh, it's E prime, it, it, it is made with, well, consider, sorry, call it P1, P2, so the pre images of two. Um, it is uh, already obtained from a, um, an elliptic curve, this time removing two points. And this variety can be embedded into a semi abelian variety, and G will be an extension of uh, GM by E. And so, uh, Faulting theorem does not, faulting Voiter theorem does not apply directly, but it applies after uh, an unramified cover. And thanks to uh, chevalier bayes theorem, uh, proving the generacy of integral points on the covering curve will be enough to prove the generacy of integral points on the bottom curve. Uh, again, if we start from a simply connected variety, if this does not embed into a semi abelian variety, there is no point in taking cover because this will be necessarily trivial. So, because it's simply connected. So, there is no way of using um, using the theory of semi abelian variety when you study a simply connected variety. While uh, our method, which is completely different based on the subspace theorem, and which makes no use of um, uh, mordal bail or uh, uh, Dirichlet uh, unit theorem, well, our method, we obtain even uh, some success in um, in the simply connected case. I show a concrete example. Take a configuration of four lines in general positions on the plane. Then we can see the three points uh, as the road. So three points on three different lines and not uh, singular points of the, of the configuration. And we blow up these three points. So consider lines D1. Uh, D2, D3, D4, and points P1, P2, P3. Consider the surface X tilde obtained by the blow up of P2 over P1, P2, P3. Now, uh, 
Uh, pi. So the the pre-image of each di is four of uh, for i equals one two three is formed of a the strict transform of di. Call it di hat plus an exceptional divisor e r and the pre image of d4 call it d4 hat is irreducible so e i is a curve which is contracted to the point p i and the i hat is sent to the i and now Consider the open surface X obtained by removing from X tilde the D1 hat union D4 hat. And I claim that X is simply connected. And um, And our main theorem applies. So the integral points are not the risky dense. For any choice of a ring of S integer. So the intersection matrix at infinity is um, as follows. So d i at d j hat equals one for i distinct from j, and then we have the d i hat square equals zero for i up to three, and d four at uh, square equals one. So you see that we have four divisors which are not not ample. There are even divisors with vanishing self intersection. Now, um, uh, well, it's simple. It's a size to find the some weights P1, P2, P3, P4, such that the conditions which I wrote on. Our main theorem are satisfied in this case. Now, um, what is the? <coughs> I like to give a, a simple arithmetic interpretation of integral points on on such a surface. Actually, when we discovered these surfaces, we were not looking for a simply connected surface to which our method could be applied. We were um, rather studying a, uh, a problem about the divisibility of values of polynomials. So I will speak about divisibility. Let us go back to uh, as you need equations in two variables. Which states the finiteness of solutions to the equation u plus v equals 1 in S units. As I said several times, it corresponds to finiteness of integral points on the complement of 0, 1, infinity on the projected line. Uh, it can be viewed as a finiteness result for a divisibility problem. Actually, U being an S unit just means that U is an S integer dividing 
1 in OS. Now, the fact that it, um, there exists the second S unit V with some equals 1 just means that 1 minus U also divides 1 in OS. So, <coughs> in other words, we have two polynomials, f1 of x equals x and f2 of x equals 1 minus x, a polynomial with s interval coefficients, and we are looking at points small x in, in the ring of s integers, such that f1 of x divides 1 and f2 of x divides 1. And the S unit equation theorem states that there are only finitely many such S integers, S, yeah, X. Now, the S unit equations in three variables, so states the degeneracy of solutions to u plus v plus w equals 1, where u, v, w are also s units. Now, we can rephrase in terms of divisibility of values of polynomials in two variables. So, we take the first polynomial f1 of xy, which is x, f2 of xy equals y, and f3 of xy equals 1 minus x minus y. Now, uh, the pairs. U, V, um, no, the pair e, X, Y in O, S cross O, S with F, I of X, Y divides 1, so I, 1, 2, 3, are in bijection with triples U, V, W satisfying u plus v plus w equals 1, and triples are of triples of s units. Again, if x divides 1, then it is a unit, call it u. If y divides 1, it is a unit, call it v. And then uh, 1 minus u minus v is a unit, we call it W, and you obtain this equation. So, we have this time three polynomials, F1, F2, F3, and three more polynomials which are all taken to be the one constant. And this divisibility problem has only, not finitely many, but a degenerate set of solutions. Uh, the problem is, what happens if we replace um, the three polyn degree one polynomials by polynomials of arbitrary degree and uh, also the constant one function by arbitrary polynomial. And what we obtain is the following generalization of the S unit equation theorem. F1, F2, F3, and G1, G2, G3 are polynomials in the ring O, S, bracket, X, Y. <coughs> so 
Кто же дает? The degree of Fi is at least equal to the degree of Gi uh, and some uh, general position conditions. So general position conditions means conditions which are generically satisfied. And for instance, one cannot take three times the same polynomial f and three times the same polynomial g. Otherwise, the three condition will be just one condition. It, it is not enough. So it's clearly that we have to, to pose some reasonable uh, condition of genericity. But the, the main point is that inequality. Uh, then points x, y in O S cross O S with uh, F I of X Y dividing G I of X Y are not the risky dance. And this is uh, in a sense, best possible, in the sense that uh, we need really to have three conditions and not two. If, with just two conditions, consider the case uh, f1 of x equals x, f2, uh, xy equals x, f2 of xy equals y, and g1 equals g2 equals 1, then we have it's a risky dense set of points x, y dividing once because, uh, in general, uh, the group of s units will be infinite. So we really need the third condition as it is in the case of s unit equation theorem. But actually, uh, we have much more generality on f and g. And the inequality is um, the weak inequality and not the strong. One. You see in the S unit equation theorem, the F have degree one and the G have degree zero. So the degree of F is strictly bigger. And the case degree of FI equals degree of GI equals one for I equals 1, 2, 3 is interesting by itself and it leads exactly to this integrality problem. So there is a bijection between the solutions x, y of this divisibility conditions and the integral points on the surface obtained after blowing up these three points and removing the four divisor as I explained. Now I'd like to, to explain better what is the relation between divisibility and integrality on, on blown up surfaces. And I'd like to show that <coughs> the pair of S integers satisfying one relation, one divisibility relation of this kind can be viewed as integral points on the surface obtained blowing up the affine plane at certain point. So consider the, the curve of equation f equals 0 and then the curve of equation g equals 0. So we are looking at points x, y in OS cross OS such that um, f of xy divides g of xy. So f of xy should not be zero, first of all. And the quotient g of xy over f of xy should be an s integer. So 
f of x, y different from 0 means that the point does not lie on this curve. So it is a point uh, like this one, point of coordinate x, y. <coughs> now, uh, the integrality means that after simplifying this fraction, there will be no prime at the denominator, or at least no prime outside s. So take a prime outside s and reduce the point in question modulo this prime. So uh, we want that either the prime does not appear at the denominator at all, which means that the point does not reduce to any point on the curve f equals 0. So it is integral with respect to uh, the curve f equals 0. Or there is another possibility that the prime p does appear at the denominator, but it also appears at the num numerator. And after simplification, uh, it will disappear from the denominator. And geometrically, what does it mean? It means that if we reduce modulo this prime, the reduction of the point x, y, modulo the prime, will be a common zero of g and f. So it will be one of these points, one of the intersection points. Now, let us wrap up these two points. We obtain on the blown up surface the strict transform of f equals 0, the strict transform of g equals 0, which have no intersection, and two exceptional divisors corresponding to the points p1, p2. Now, <coughs> if the point x, y reduces modulo p to, let's say, p1, this means that uh, on the blown up surface it will be a point on E1. And we further require that after simplification the prime disappear, disappears from F. So either it remains on the numerator or it completely disappears from the fraction. In the first case, if it remains on the numerator, it means that the point reduces modulo this prime on the blown up surface to that point. So it still remains on g equals 0 after blowing up. If it disappears completely, it reduces to, to some point, which is neither on f equals 0 nor on g equals 0. And what we don't want is that it reduce to this. This would mean that after simplification, it disappears from the numerator and it remains there. So in any case, we want that it does not reduce to the strict transform of the curve f equals 0. So it is uh, a condition of integrality, but not on the, not on the fine, but on the, on the blown up surface. And in the case, of the configuration which I write again. So uh, one of the line is the line at infinity. Uh, the other lines are given by the equation f1 equals 0. So f1 is a polynomial of degree 1. So its 0 set is a, a line. <coughs> Then we have the equation f2 equals 0, um, f3 equals 0. So we take uh, another degree 1 polynomial, g1, and the line of equation g1 equals 0 will intersect the line of equation f1 equals 0 in this point. Then the second polynomial g2. We consider the intersection points with the second line and the third polynomial, G3, 
and we consider its intersection point on the third line. And so we obtain that the divisibility conditions fi divides gi uh, amounts to integrality as explained. Okay, so uh, there are other applications of of our main theorem. Uh, for instance, to parametric as you need equation. So, let us come back again at the uh, Uh, as you need equation two variables, I always wrote the equation as u plus v equals one, but I can change by adding coefficients a u plus b v equals one or even equal c, where a B, C are non-zero as integers, which are fixed, and we consider solutions in U, V, the unknown, and they are as units. The finiteness of solution to such an equation is formally deduced from the finiteness of solution of the um, previous equation u plus v equals 1, you simply can enlarge the set S so that a, b, and c become S units. Then we can divide by c, so we obtain a, c, u plus uh, b over c, b equals 1, and this call it u prime, this is v prime, you obtain again the same solution. So anytime you fix the, the coefficients, you have finiteness. Of course, if you let coefficients vary, you'll have infinitely many solutions. And one can consider the problem where A, B, C vary algebraically in, a, in an algebraic family. For instance, our values of polynomials or rational functions. So, you can consider <coughs> consider three polynomials uh, f of t, g of t, h of t with s integral coefficients and study the equation f T u plus g t v equals h of t to be solved in t u v, where t is an s integer and u v are s units. And one can try to prove finiteness or degeneracy of solutions for such an equation in three variables. The, the s unit equation theorem just says that for each fixed value of t, there will be only finitely many solutions in uv. But 
if you let t vary, you can have finitely many solutions, infinitely many often, so globally, infinitely many solutions. Actually, one can consider um, the generate cases, for instance, if, um, if h of t, we can suppose that f, f g h have no common factors, but if you take a zero, for instance, of polynomial h, you obtain, uh, so if h of t0 equals 0, then you obtain the equation f t0 u plus g t0 v equals 0, and then if uh, f of t0 over g of t0 is an S unit, you have infinitely many solutions, uv. And uh, the same happens if uh, f of g vanish. They can give rise to a, an infinite set of solutions. So these are the, the generate solutions, the, the, the trivial way of producing infinitely many solutions. And one can uh, try to prove that uh, for such an equation, uh, all but finitely many solutions are obtained in a trivial way. as explained. Again, it is, uh, a, um, it is a problem about integral points on rational surfaces, because you have three variables and just one equation, so the complex solution to this equation form a surface. And actually there are some results in um, In this direction, one is uh, was obtained by Aaron Levin. Consider the case uh, degree of f plus degree of g equals degree of h, and he proves the generacy. apart uh, trivial cases and he obtains the theorem by compactifying uh, with the surface uh, p1 cos p1 so he translates this problem into an integrality problem on the complement of certain curves on p cos p1. And then it proves that uh, basically our main theorem on, on surfaces applies to this configuration. What I considered with uh, Zamner is the case uh, where f g h have the same degree and again we prove the generacy Part trivial cases, and um, actually we considered another compactification, not P1 cross P1, but we consider a so-called Hirzebruch surface. So we can compactify in this way. We can let f tilde, g tilde, h tilde, the, the homogeneous forms associated to f g h, which are homogeneous forms uh, in, in two variables, uh, t0, t1, so that for instance, f tilde of 1 t1 equals f of t1. And then uh, we compactify in the, the variable uv by adding a new variable w. So 
the compact for uh, is given in uh, P2 cross P1, not in P3, as F tilde T0 T1 U plus G tilde T0 T1 V equals H tilde T0 T1. So the projective coordinate are U V W and uh, T0 T1. So we have P2 cos P1. Now, now we let uh, X tilde be the hypersurface, so the surface in P2 cos P1 defined by this bi-homogeneous equation. And clearly, uh, X tilde is endowed with projection to P1, uh, sending the point uh, U, V, W, T0, T1 to the point T0, T1 and the pre-image of each point in P1, so the fiber is a line in uh, P2. Whenever you fix T0, T1, the equation in UVW is a linear equation. So uh, it defines a, a projective line in, in the projective plane. So geometrically, this is a line bundle on P1. And it turns out that it is isomorphic to the deep Erzebus surface. where D is the degree of F and G and Y. And H is the common degree of the three polynomials. And this is the right compactification to work with to apply our theorem. And the divisors at infinity are uh, given by equation u equals 0, p equals 0, w equals 0, and t0 uh, equals 0. So this, the, this is, corresponds to the integrality conditions on t, it means that we are searching for t and less integer, not an s unit, and not, uh, sorry, not uh, an arbitrary uh, scalar in the field. And uh, these are the integrality condition on UVW, which on, or if you dehomogenize on UV, uh, we are searching for S unit solutions in UV. So finally, you have to remove uh, um, four devices. One of each is a fiber. So has vanishing self-intersection, it's not ample in particular, and the other three are, uh, well, for the other three it's easy to, to compute intersection products, intersection squares, and can be proved that our main theorem applies. Uh, now, a last application. Consider quadratic integral points and curves. So 
So we've taken a fine curve. Define over number field k, we take a ring of s integers, so s, and we consider the points p, c, oh, k bar, such that the degree, the residue degree of p is most 1, and p is. Uh, Say S prime integral where S prime is the set of places above uh, S. So the coordinates of P are not in K, they are uh, in a field of degree 2 over K. And this field depends on p. We do not fix uh, uh, a number of fields, so there are infinitely many quadratic extensions of k, so uh, the number of fields is not fixed. But, and the integrality condition is that coordinates of p are, um, well, the algebraic integers, is s is just the set of places, or, or Archimedean places, or uh, s prime integral, where s prime and again, we can um, view uh, such a problem as uh, a problem about integral points on a surface. Because we consider the symmetric square square of C. This means that consider the quotient of the usual square, so the product of the curve itself, modulo the natural action of the permutation group S2, group of permutations of coordinates, the The quotient variety is uh, is indeed an algebraic variety, and its points correspond to unordered pairs of points of C. Now, a quadratic point of on C, P is an algebraic point of degree or defined over the field of degree two. Then it will have uh, one Galois. Uh, Conjugate and we consider the the unordered pair P P prime this can be view is a point in X. And this point will be rational because it is fixed by the action of the Galois group. The non-trivial element of the Galois group interchanges P and P prime, so it does not change the unordered pair P P prime. Uh, <coughs> and also the integrality conditions on C can be rephrased in terms of an integrality condition on x. So the problem of quadratic integral points on the curve corresponds uh, to a problem of uh, rational integral point on, on a surface. And actually what we obtain is that if C has at least five points at infinity, we have finiteness and if C has four points at infinity we have degeneracy 
and both theorems are um, the best possible. So um, for three points at infinity, w one can produce examples where integral points are uh, quadratic integral points are the risky dense. And for four points, uh, in general, there is no finiteness. And actually, what we proved is that the degeneracy arises only in the, well, in infinite uh, degenerate family can arise only in the, in, in a trivial way. Trivial way means that if you take, suppose that C equals C tilde minus P1, uh, P4. And suppose that in the Jacobian, P1 plus P2 is equivalent to P3 plus P4 in the Jacobian. Then there will be a function having all its poles in uh, P3, P4, or all its zero in P1, P2. And this function gives um, a degree to map from C to GM. If you see it, uh, C tilde compactify in P1, and this arrow is the, the rational function having all the zeros in P1, P2, or the poles in P3, P4. And in GM, rational point, uh, integral points are uh, the risky dense for OS sufficiently large. And you take the, the pre-image by a degree to morph it, you obtain integral points which are at most quadratic. And all the, the trivial families arise in, in this way. So I think I stop here and Thank you very much for your attention and for the invitation. It was a pleasure for me to spend uh, these uh, three weeks uh, in Chennai. I hope to have other occasions in the future. Thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, well, it actually, it, uh, with a good rot theorem with moving target, might be applied, but but I don't think that what we know about rot theorem with moving target is enough to uh, to, to, uh, to obtain the this theorem. Actually, you can use the theorem of with moving target by taking uh, taking roots by uh, transforming the S unit equation to a two equation, for instance. And then you have to approximate the, for instance, the cube root of the nth root of the values of f g h. But I don't I don't think that what we can do by simply Diophantine approximation on the line. Uh, suffices to obtain uh, such a result.